works as a manager there. And you know, we're actually recording tonight's event. So I'll just start over for a moment for recording sake. Um, my name is Jillian McEwen. I'm the adult services manager at the Wilmette Public Library. Thank you for joining us for this Zoom program. Um, just to remind everybody that this is a Zoom webinar. And what that means is that all of you can see us, but we cannot see or hear you. So please feel free to relax, kick back, um, if you have any questions this evening, feel free to please enter them into the chat or the Q&A function. I um, mean, I will do my best to get to them. There will be a Q&A at the end. So if anything pops up, just go ahead and um, type it in and I'll do my best to get to it. Um, so we are so excited to have Don Clark joining us tonight for summary judgment. Um, and he's going to talk for the first part, and then um, he will talk about the book. And then again, I will have some questions for Don, but please don't be shy about submitting your own. And also there is closed captioning on your computer right now. If you cannot see it, that means that you probably have to adjust your own settings on your own device or computer. So if you do need closed captioning and you cannot see them, please feel free to go ahead and um, search around your settings right now. So I feel like when we say Don Clark is a Renaissance man, I feel like that's almost an understatement with all of the things that I have read about Don Clark and have heard about Don Clark in real life. Um, he believes in the power of storytelling and it's whether it's to a jury, a theater, his grandchildren, um, which is probably the best audience to be honest. Um, he began his professional career as a trial lawyer, I'm sorry, as a trial attorney at some of Chicago's most venerable law firms. And he was the executive producer of the award-winning um, award feature film, The Guest Artist, um, which was written and starring Jeff Daniels. Uh, he produces plays on Broadway and here in Chicago. And he also co-owns the Chicago Magic Lounge, which I know is probably very exciting to many of you here. Um, a nightlife venue that is top rated on TripAdvisor and one of Chicago's best, according to Chicago Magazine. And as I was telling Don earlier, I do not know one person who has not raved about this location. And they are all thoroughly appalled that I've never been there personally. So it is definitely on my to-do list for soon. Um, but about the book, um, admittedly, I did push off reading it um, until the last minute because I wanted it to be really fresh on my mind. I started reading it about a month ago and then I put it away and started about a week or two ago. Um, and I can, if you have not read it, there are extra copies on ebook, print, and our hot pick section, recent arrivals. I highly recommend you pick it up and I'm sure you will after you listen to Don tonight, but it really struck me because it just, it, and we'll talk about this too, because I want to talk about your style later, but it just so read almost like fiction to me and seemed like it was, it was, you know, kind of those like reality is stranger than fiction sometimes kind of stories. Um, so I'm really excited to hear about it, but basically the short synopsis um, that you'll hear about more later is it's the fascinating true story of two Chicago lawyers and an Alabama nun who volunteered to represent a death row inmate and the struggle to prove um, that he is not legally guilty um, even though he is truly not innocent, right? Um, this is his first book, which is kind of unbelievable to me given the way that it was written. Um, and Don talks about his experiencing representing the 20-year-old uh, who's on death row, Tommy Hamilton and who was a condemned murderer awaiting execution by electrocution on death row in Alabama. Um, so the book shares the story of um, this life and death tale um, as it unfolded in real time and raises the provocative issue of, you know, defending the guilty as an important aspect of justice work. Um, so if you are, a fan, if you haven't read it yet and you're a fan of you know, true crime or legal thrillers, I mean, you, you are really gonna love this as much as I did. Um, but I would like to hear it from Don's lips instead of my gushing. So thank you so much, Don, for joining us and please take it away. Well, thank you, Julian. And I wanna thank you and the Wilmette Public Library for inviting me to, to make this presentation, for hosting me tonight. 
And I look forward to hosting you at the Chicago Magic Lounge. We've got to get you there. I always wanted to be a lawyer, a trial lawyer. I wanted to spend my professional career appearing in courtrooms, representing clients in the winner-take-all environment that is litigation. I graduated from Rutgers Law School in 1979, and I returned home to Illinois and started work as a litigation associate at the Chicago law firm of Isham, Lincoln, and Beal. The Lincoln in the firm's name was Robert Todd Lincoln, the only surviving son of President Abraham Lincoln. Isham, Lincoln, and Beale was the oldest continuously operating law firm in Illinois. And for my first seven years there, I did what I always hoped I would do. I represented premier corporate clients in high dollar litigation in state and federal courts. And I did it in the environment that I loved, an environment where the first question the partners asked me every time I returned from court was always the same. Did you win? And there was only one acceptable answer to that question. I found the pressure exhilarating. After seven years of representing Fortune 500 companies that paid premium hourly rates for their legal talent, I was reminded of my professional call to do work for those who are not as economically resourced and to pursue other forms of justice. In 1976, the year in which I began attending law school, the United, Supreme Court, United States Supreme Court had reinstated the death penalty as a constitutionally permissible form of punishment if it was administered justly. While debate over the efficacy of the death penalty resumed, so did its imposition. Now, as many of you know, in the case of Gideon versus Wainwright, the United States Supreme Court held that criminal defendants have a constitutional right to have a lawyer appointed to represent them if they are unable to afford one themselves. And so indigents charged with crimes, including murder, have access to lawyers to represent them at trial and during appeals of their trial outcomes and convictions. After a conviction, death row defendants still have one final legal remedy available to them before they are executed. They can contest the constitutionality of their conviction and sentence by seeking a writ of habeas corpus. But in 1989, the United States Supreme Court held that there is no constitutional right to an appointed lawyer in such post-conviction proceedings. And so after this decision, the section of litigation of the American Bar Association sent a letter to all its members, and I was one of them. The letter acknowledged that some lawyers are in favor of the death penalty and some lawyers are opposed to the death penalty. But it implored that the one thing that all lawyers should embrace is the notion that if a legal remedy exists, there should be meaningful access to that remedy. And when it came to death row inmates, lawyers were not volunteering to represent them in post-conviction proceedings. And the courts were not appointing lawyers to represent them. And so the ABA was seeking volunteers to review the convictions and represent these inmates and to determine whether an injustice had occurred. I volunteered to do that. In 1984, Tommy Lee Hamilton was 20 years old. He'd been raised in rural Alabama along with two older sisters and one older brother. Tommy had received the equivalent of a sixth grade education. He had an IQ of 72, which placed him well below the norm. Indeed, he was borderline intellect. And he had a history of minor trouble with the law, but none of them involved crimes of violence. His father was an alcoholic 
and had been so abusive to the family that they spent many nights sleeping in a cotton field adjacent to the family home to escape his physical and psychological abuse. At approximately 8.30 p.m. on the evening of July 11, 1984, Hamilton was arrested along with his 16-year-old wife of just seven days and his 27-year-old sister. The three were charged with the murder of Lehman Wood. Wood, a prominent citizen of Moulton, Alabama, and the longtime director of the Lawrence County Department of Emergency Services, had been found earlier that evening lying in front of his 1981 Ford pickup truck on a gravel road in the Bankhead National Forest. He had been shot twice, once through the neck and once through the chest with a 30-30 deer rifle. On August 30th, 1985, at the conclusion of the guilt phase of Tommy's trial, Tommy was convicted of committing murder during the course of a robbery, a capital or death penalty eligible offense. Immediately following Tommy's conviction, the sentencing phase of his trial began. At the conclusion of a hearing, 10 jurors voted that Tommy should be sentenced to death by electrocution. Two jurors voted that Tommy should be sentenced to life without parole. The jury's 10 to 2 vote represented the minimum necessary to sustain a recommendation for a death sentence. Subsequently, a further sentencing hearing was held before the trial judge, the Honorable Billy C. Burney. At the conclusion of this hearing, Judge Burney, on the minimum recommendation, sentenced Tommy to the maximum penalty, death by electrocution. In 1987, on appeal to the Alabama Court of Criminal Appeals, Tommy's capital conviction and sentence of death was affirmed. On further appeal, the judgment of the Alabama Court of Criminal Appeals was swiftly affirmed by the Alabama Supreme Court. And October 3 of 1988, a petition for review was denied by the United States Supreme Court. Tommy had been convicted, sentenced to death, lost all of his direct appeals, and was awaiting execution on death row at the West Jefferson Correctional Facility in Bessemer, Alabama. It was then that I received a letter from the ABA telling me that I had been assigned to represent Tommy Hamilton. Luke DeGrand, a, an associate with the law firm that I was with, agreed to help me. But among the first things that we told the American Bar Association was that we lived in Illinois and we worked in Illinois and we would be doing this work pro bono or for free and we needed more help. We needed a local attorney in Alabama to assist us. The ABA told us that, of course, they had tried to find an Alabama attorney to be lead counsel in representing Tommy, but representing death row inmates carried a stigma in the legal community and the wider community as well, and it was difficult to get attorneys to volunteer for such work. But later on, they told us that they had found a person willing to do it and they introduced us to Lynn McKenzie. They more fully introduced us to Sister Lynn McKenzie, who was a Roman Catholic nun in the Benedictine order. They had persuaded her to join our team. And in fact, the Benedictine order has its nuns not only perform religious service, but to carry their service into the secular world. And Lynn was, in fact, a practicing attorney. And so two corporate lawyers from Chicago and a Roman Catholic nun in Alabama became Tommy Hamilton's post-conviction legal team. The clock was ticking. 
And among the first things that we did is review the court files and the trial transcripts in connection with Tommy's original trial. Issue spotting is one of the first things you do when you represent a client. And this review revealed a number of things. At trial, Tommy had also had a legal team. Because he was indigent, Tommy was appointed attorney Wesley Lavender as his defense counsel. Lavender, in turn, got the court to appoint attorney Barnes Loveless to assist him. Importantly, the files and the transcript also revealed that one Jimmy Dale Owens had testified against Tommy at trial. Jimmy Dale was in the Lawrence County Jail at the time that Tommy was awaiting trial for, on the murder charges and was in effect a cellmate with Tommy. During the guilt phase of Tommy's trial, Jimmy Dale testified that while they were in jail together, Tommy said to him, among other things, the son of a bitch deserved dying and he would do it again if he had to. Opposing us in the post-conviction proceedings with the Alabama Attorney General and the Death Penalty Post-Conviction Department in his office, which specialized in this work. Next to Texas and Florida, Alabama was the most prolific death penalty state in the nation. The lawyers we faced were experts in their field. And at the end of the proceedings, they were led by then Alabama Attorney General Jeff Sessions. On February 28th of 1989, a mere five months after the United States Supreme Court had refused to review Tommy's case, we filed a petition for relief from conviction and sentence of death in the Circuit Court of Lawrence County, Alabama the same court where Tommy had been tried, convicted, and sentenced to die. The first issue we raised in our petition was that one of Tommy's lawyers was statutorily unqualified and that both Tommy's lawyers were constitutionally ineffective in their representation. By statute, Alabama law requires the counsel appointed to represent a defendant charged with a capital offense have at least five years of experience in the active practice of criminal law. Notwithstanding and in violation of this statutory provision, the court had appointed Mr. Barnes Loveless, a recent law school graduate, as Tommy's trial counsel. At the time of his appointment as co-counsel for Tommy, Mr. Loveless had only been practicing law of any kind, much less the active practice of criminal law, for less than two years. And even though he was statutorily unqualified to conduct Tommy's defense, Mr. Loveless was allowed to assume responsibility for and actually conduct some of the most important aspects of Tommy's trial. For example, Mr. Loveless gave the opening statement to the jury on Tommy's behalf. He cross-examined 13 of the prosecution's witnesses. He conducted the direct examination of half of the witnesses called by the defense. And he presented during the all important first half of the closing argument on Tommy's behalf. He also made the presentation to the jury in support of a recommended sentence of life imprisonment. As for attorney Wesley Lavender, he was a suffering alcoholic. We argued that Tommy's representation, especially during the sentencing phase of his trial was woefully inadequate. Indeed, the entire case presented by attorneys Lavender and Loveless on Tommy's behalf at the sentencing phase of his trial consisted of a mere four witnesses, and it took fewer than 20 pages to transcribe. We argued that this type of representation in a capital case shocks the conscience and is precisely what the Alabama Code and the 6th and 14th Amendments to the United States Constitution were designed to prevent. They sounded like pretty good arguments to me at the time. But one of these arguments was a delicate issue for me to raise. 
For here I was representing Tommy Hamilton, contesting his death sentence, and I did not have five years of prior experience in the active practice of criminal law. Our most powerful contention was that the prosecution knowingly presented perjured testimony at Tommy's trial. We argued that Jimmy Dale Owens, the key prosecution witness to testify at Tommy's trial, lied when he testified that Tommy confided he was guilty of capital murder and was totally unrepentant. A post-conviction proceeding is like a trial. You call witnesses and present other evidence just as you would during trial. To prove our contention, we located William Eddy Oliver, Jimmy Dale Owens' cellmate also at the time that Tommy was incarcerated and awaiting trial. Oliver was prepared to testify that Jimmy Dale Owens told him that the testimony he was going to give at Tommy's trial would be false. Owens' motive for lying at Tommy's trial was pure self-interest. Since the prosecution had entered into a plea agreement with Tommy's wife, Debbie, in exchange for her testimony, we researched the history surrounding Jimmy Dale Owens' testimony. And we discovered that in January of 1986, a mere five months after he testified against Tommy Hamilton, Jimmy Dale Owens was released early from the Lawrence County Jail. Specifically, then Sheriff Dan Ligon made a private request to Judge Burney to secure Owens release and arrangements were made for Owens to leave Alabama and go to the state of Georgia. Proving our contention was difficult. Jimmy Dale Owens departure from Lawrence County lasted only a few months. He was back in the Lawrence County Jail before the end of 1986. But unfortunately for us, perhaps convenient for some, Owens was found hung in his jail cell. So Owens was not available to us as a witness. And Oliver was more than a reluctant witness. He was out on parole after having himself been convicted of murder and he feared law enforcement reprisals, including revocation of his parole and resumption of his life sentence if he testified to what he knew. He refused to appear in an Alabama court, but we obtained court orders allowing Oliver to testify by videotape depositions taken out of state. And on adverse witness examination, we got the law enforcement and parole officers to admit to the unusual nature of Owen's release from jail. Finally, another inmate, Anthony Winchester, testified consistent with Oliver. Specifically, Winchester heard Jimmy Dale Owens state after his testimony at Tommy's trial, but before his early release, they ain't done what they were going to do for me. And that they told me they would cut me loose if I testified for them against Tommy. At no time did the prosecution advise Tommy's trial attorneys of the fact that Jimmy Dale Owens had been provided favorable treatment in exchange for his testimony. And so our petition to vacate Tommy's conviction and death sentence was not a plea for mercy. It was a plea for justice. The post-conviction proceedings were exhausting. They began on a Monday and we called witnesses and presented other evidence and arguments for a full week. The following Monday, the state would begin presenting its witnesses and its evidence to refute our claims. But on that Friday night, after we rested our case, I collapsed into bed and thought I would sleep the entire weekend. But this was not to be. At 6 a.m. on Saturday morning, my telephone rang. Our client, Tommy Hamilton, 
had escaped from the jail he was being held in while the post-conviction proceedings were being conducted. He had been recaptured and now was in a different jail. Tommy was lucky that law enforcement had not carried out his death sentence while he was on the run. A convicted murderer who had been ordered to die was on the loose in the streets of Florence, Alabama. But law enforcement <clears throat> took him into custody without incident. And so <clears throat> Tommy, we needed to meet with him to find out what had happened and why. After having woken our judge at his home that Saturday morning to obtain a handwritten order giving us permission to see our client in jail, we spent the remainder of the weekend researching Supreme Court precedent on whether escape constituted a waiver of one's rights to post-conviction relief. Fortunately, the post-conviction proceedings continued Monday with us agreeing with the judge that Tommy could be held in jail rather than in the judge's courtroom for the remainder of those proceedings. After the state concluded its presentation, it took more than two years for the trial court to rule on our petition. Finally, Judge Ned Michael Suttle ruled. He summarily rejected our qualification of counsel claim. On the other hand, he agreed with our argument that Hamilton's lawyers did not provide Tommy with reasonably effective legal re representation during the sentencing phase of his trial. And he found this for a number of reasons. Their failure to seek independent psychiatric or psychological evaluation of Tommy, their failure to present numerous mental health issues that Tommy suffered from, their failure to call available witnesses who would have testified to mitigating circumstances, and their failure to fully present evidence of the abusive childhood that Tommy had been raised in. On our perjured and purchased testimony arguments, the court found, the court is reasonably well satisfied that Owen's statements that Hamilton said the son of a bitch deserved dying and he would do it again were perjured. And the court also found that with the exception of law enforcement's denials that they solicited testimony in exchange for a promise of lenient treatment, that in fact, Owen, Owens had been led to believe that he would receive early release from jail if he testified. But Judge Suttle held that there was no chance that a jury would have reached a different verdict regarding the capital murder charge if the jury had heard the truth. And he did find that a jury might have returned a different sentencing recommendation. And he noted that the fact that the jury's recommendation for the death being 10 to 2 and the minimum allowed by law to sustain that meant that if only one juror had changed their mind because of hearing the truth of the matter, that Tommy might have not been sentenced to death by electrocution. And so Judge Suttle concluded, Hamilton may deserve the death penalty and he may yet receive it. However, if he is to be executed, he must receive a sentencing hearing where all reasonably available evidence is presented to the jury. The court therefore ordered that Hamilton was granted a new sentencing hearing. There would only be two possible outcomes at a new sentencing hearing. Tommy could be resentenced to death or he could be sentenced to life in prison without any possibility of parole. And in Alabama, when they say no possibility of parole, they mean it. So the question was, was this a victory? Not in our client's eyes. Tommy Hamilton had made it clear to us from the very beginning that the only thing he feared more than being strapped into the electric chair was being incarcerated for the rest of his life. 
He feared death by incarceration more than he feared death by electrocution. I was dissatisfied too. Judge Suttle was simply wrong. The purchase perjured testimony had been presented during the guilt phase of Tommy's trial, not during the sentencing phase. And so the verdict and not just the sentence were tainted. Both sides appealed the judge's ruling to the Alabama Court of Criminal Appeals. The state seeking to have both the conviction and death sentence affirmed and us seeking to have both overturned. Our argument to the appellate court was pointed. No other type of error is as pernicious and detrimental to the truth seeking function of a trial and a just verdict as is perjury. Nor can the toxicity of this poison be so easily contained as is suggested by the lower court's order. While Judge Suttle struggles to suggest that the perjured testimony Jimmy Dale Owens offered only directly dealt with matters relevant to a sentencing determination, and therefore that a new sentencing hearing alone would cure this ill, the fact of the matter is that Owens' false and fraudulent testimony was offered and admitted during the guilt phase of Tommy Hamilton's trial. On October 30th of 1995, Judge Sue Bell Cobb issued the unanimous ruling for the Alabama Court of Criminal Appeals. Granting a new sentencing hearing is not an appropriate remedy given the findings made by the judge. The court found that the trial of Tommy Hamilton entertained perjured testimony and that the state had withheld exculpatory evidence. In addition, the court found that prosecutorial misconduct and ineffective assistance of counsel were factors in this trial. Given these findings, it's impossible to imagine that the petitioner received a trial that satisfied the minimum constitutional requirements for a fair trial as contemplated by and guaranteed under the United States and Alabama constitutions. Clearly then the property proper remedy was to vacate both the conviction and the sentence. Tommy's case therefore reverted back to Lawrence County, Alabama and the local district attorney. The local district attorney advised us that he felt that the decision by the Alabama Court of Criminal Appeals was of little moment, that he would simply retry Tommy on the charge of capital murder convict him once again, and again, get him sentenced to death. In response, we told the district attorney that there would be at least one difference in a second trial of Tommy on these charges. And that would be that we would stay on as defense counsel and we would represent Tommy at that trial. And that we would intend to put the law enforcement apparatus of Lawrence County, Alabama on trial. After both sides kind of puffed their chests and engaged in bravado, we finally got down to negotiating a just outcome in this case. What we ended up doing is entering into a plea agreement where Tommy agreed to plead guilty to murder as opposed to capital murder and would agree to a life with possibility of parole sentence. There would not be a guarantee that he would get parole, but at least he would be eligible for it. And to meet some of the demands and interests of the local district attorney, we further agreed that Tommy would serve another seven years, having already been incarcerated for seven years, before he would become eligible for that possibility of parole, in effect agreeing to a minimum 14 year sentence. What ended up happening is that Tommy ended up serving 20 years and then the Alabama Board of Pardons of Paroles granted Tommy parole. Did Tommy Hamilton ambush Lehman Wood and kill him in cold blood? Yes, he did. 
And so I'm often asked, how could I represent him and help cause to set him free? I did not put Tommy Hamilton back on the streets. Law enforcement made that possible by violating the constitutional rights of a citizen, sullying the justice system and overreaching to secure a death sentence. And it was the Alabama Board of Pardon and Paroles that made the decision after deciding that Tommy had been sufficiently punished. But I did play my part and the reasons why include these. I believe that the conviction of innocent persons is not the only possible flaw in a criminal justice system. And we should not be hostile or indifferent to other types of injustice. To deny anyone a robust defense, even someone who may be factually guilty, would be to put everyone's liberty at risk. Ensuring that law enforcement does not suborn perjury and challenging whether defendants receive effective assistance of counsel are efforts to ensure that the constitutional principles be upheld not only in a given case, but in every case. Ensuring that criminal proceedings are free from constitutional defects is as much a criminal defense attorney's job as arguing about factual guilt or innocence. And so in my mind, I was not so much defending the man and what he had done as I was defending the law under which he should have been tried in the first place. Where are they now? Well, as I mentioned, Tommy Hamilton was paroled after serving 20 years in prison. He began living at home with his mother. But after a while, he found himself back in jail, having allegedly threatened his parole officer. And as I speak to you tonight, he is awaiting trial on charges for those threats and the possibility that his parole will be permanently revoked as a result. As you know, Alabama Attorney General Jeff Sessions went on to become U.S. Senator and U.S. Attorney General in the Trump administration. Judge Sue Bell Cobb became the first woman to serve as Chief Justice of the Alabama Supreme Court. And Sister Lynn McKenzie continued to do what she has always done. Among other things, she was made president of the Benedictine Sisters of the Federation of St. Scholastica, a union of 20 monasteries in the United States and Mexico. And Sister Lynn, once again, is doing good. And me, well, I became the author of a book about it all. And I, as Jillian mentioned, am the co-owner of the Chicago Magic Lounge. I've enjoyed having this opportunity to share with you some of the story of Tommy Hamilton and this particular case, and I'll be happy to answer questions you might have. Great, thank you. Uh, we do have a few questions um, in the chat, um, but I'm gonna go ahead and um, you know, first start with a few of my own. So if anybody has anything on their mind, again, please feel free to chat it in or put it in the Q&A. So, you know, basic question, but I feel like it needs to be asked. Um, you know, this is the first book that you wrote. You know, I feel like if anyone has heard an author speak, you know, they have, it is, it seems to be a painstaking process, right? Um, so can you tell us what that process was like for you? Well, while I had wanted to tell this story for a long time, I had never really found the opportunity and the discipline to put pen to paper. But COVID provided that opportunity. <laughs> and so while all of us were sheltered and quarantining and otherwise restricted in the activities that we otherwise would have pursued, I started writing this book uh, during that COVID isolation. And it gave me the time and, and discipline to be focused on it. And so I wrote almost daily. Uh, 
and that's how the story finally got reduced to writing. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, good for you. Cause I know that, you know, I feel like people are in kind of two camps. The, I cannot think and function as a human or the people who were super productive. So, so kudos to you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read one of the questions from the chat. Did, uh, did the Alabama attorney generals have the obligation to point out to the court that the appointed defense attorneys were not statutorily qualified? Well, prosecutors uh, are ethically obligated to do more than to simply seek a conviction. And so they are sworn and ethically obligated to see that justice is done and that the laws are followed. Um, it was a um, question of first impression in Alabama as to whether a second appointed attorney who failed to meet the five-year statutory requirement uh, rendered all of the defense that it presented to be in violation of the statute. And so arguments could be made on both sides. I still believe our position was correct, but I wouldn't fault the attorney general's office for not conceding that argument. And I, and I don't have any reason to believe that the uh, district attorney was uh, aware of what the sheriff's office and law enforcement investigators had done in terms of soliciting the perjured testimony. And while those, that misconduct is attributable to the prosecution, whether he knew it or not, uh, I don't have reason to believe that that particular district attorney violated an oath or obligation that he had undertaken. Okay, thank you. Um, so just to go back to the, the process a little bit, swing back, um, you know, reading this, um, it did remind me a little bit of, though it may sound cliche, of In Cold Blood, um, which is, you know, to me, the biggest compliment. And it, it really did read, as I was saying before, like, like a narrative, like fiction, um, you know, and also it was the way in which you wrote where, you know, it wasn't stuffy. It wasn't, I mean, there was some legal jargon, but it wasn't in, it, it was accessible, you know, to even like the most lay people, um, which is myself. Um, so I'm wondering, I mean, how, how, did you have any inspiration for the, you know, from any other books or how did you organize it? Because I really felt like you did a wonderful job of portraying the characters, the people, I mean, even Tommy in this sympathetic light where it was almost like nobody was above you or below you. You were able to have compassion for everybody on some level. So how, how were you able to do that? And then also, did you, were you inspired in any way by any other media? I, I wanted to give the reader as much as possible a you are there feel. And so that's why the book does reproduce uh, many instances of actual trial transcript. You see what cross-examination was like, the questions asked, the answers given. Uh, I also wanted to give insight into at least our thinking in terms of defense strategy, the challenges as we assess them, where we thought the case was strong, where we thought the case was weak, and therefore why we made the decisions that we did. Uh, I don't know that I was trying to um, reflect and certainly not to mimic uh, other approaches taken in, in other books, but I did, this is a true story. I wanted to relay it as accurately and as truthfully as I could and have the readers experience uh, to some extent what we experienced in taking this case on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did, um, do you know if Tommy read the book? I do not know. Uh, I had communication with Tommy up until about February of this year, and then uh, that stopped. Uh, so it was pre-publication that um, 
my last communication with him was, and so I don't do not know if he has read the book. Okay. Did he? Um, what were his? I mean, how? What were his feelings about you writing this and telling his tale? Um, ethically, I needed Tommy's permission in order to uh, write this book. Uh, we attorneys have got attorney client confidentiality that needs to be respected and absent his permission, I would not have been able to uh, tell the story and certainly not in the detail uh, that I did. But once Tommy had been paroled, I went down and saw him in Alabama and he gave me that permission. So the book was being done with his full knowledge and, and his uh, agreement. Uh, and I believe it's truthful and accurate, and um, uh, I, I would hope you would be accepting of it. Okay, thanks. So, you know, reading this book, it was really interesting the, you know, the tangents you took into the, you know, history. Um, so I really, I wanna know about the research. So you, you know, it was history of different cases at different courthouses, capital punishment in America. And, you know, all of this information really spanned centuries, <laughs> which was really impressive. I was also struck by, you know, to me, the shocking secret of your family in the 1600s about your ancestor, which was so amazing. Um, so can you talk about some of the, how you went about researching that history? Well, in terms of uh, the history of the death penalty in America, I mean, I've always been interested in the death penalty as a legal and moral issue. And that certainly is one of the reasons I volunteered to do this work. And early on in both my high school and college years, I had kind of absorbed a lot of writings on the death penalty, uh, arguments for, arguments against, arguments about whether it serves a deterrent function, arguments about whether retribution is a justifiable uh, grounds for taking a human life. And so I was very much into it from both a philosophical perspective and then also uh, as an aspiring lawyer, uh, I and given the developments that had occurred at the at, at fundamental times in my career, as I mentioned, 1976, the Supreme Court reinstates the death penalty. And uh, so reading those opinions and being aware of the evolution of the court's thinking on the death penalty was something that uh, I was familiar with. I mean, I certainly researched to get the detail uh, of it and to uh, set it out to give some context to the reader. Uh, and then also I do lift up a number of the cases in Alabama where executions were taking place and the circumstances in which those individuals have been convicted and, and executed uh, because that was happening all while we were defending Tommy Hamilton. And it, and it produce some of the pressure. I mean, we were acutely aware of what the stakes were in this case because people were being led off of Alabama's death row and electrocuted while we were defending Tommy Hamilton. So we very much felt the pressure uh, and it was a truly a life or death situation. And uh, I wanted to convey that uh, in the book. Okay, thanks. And, um... We have a question here that I'll get to. Let's see. Can you go, um, can you please describe the role of the the nun, the sister, as part of your defense team? Sure, I, I, I try and do that uh, in the book as well. Um, but Sister Lynn was invaluable to us as, as a partner in uh, representing Tommy. One, she certainly brought uh, a, an experience of the judicial system in Alabama. Uh, the judges down there that's just invaluable. It's just invaluable to have local counsel in any type of case if you're an out of town or an out of state lawyer. And she certainly provided that to us. She certainly had a very different life experience than we had and uh, brought that to bear in terms of the representation. Uh, Sister Lim was very uh, empathetic and sympathetic and um, provided uh, support and resource to Tommy in that regard. 
certainly much better than I did. Um, and she also reminded us of the importance of that. Lynn's approach always was uh, much more carrot than stick in terms of pursuing witnesses who could provide information for us. Uh, and she just was invaluable in so many ways, uh, but certainly uh, was helpful to us in terms of schooling us into local practice and procedure and also complementing that portion of our team uh, by bringing that very human uh, approach to not only our client, but to all the people that we had to uh, deal with and investigate in order to put the best case forward that we could. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I also, um, just to play off that, I love that part where you talked about how, um, you know, you talked to, I think it was like a clerk and you're a kind of like gruff Midwesterner, like get me what I need. And she was like, hang on, like, that's not how we do it down here. Exactly. Um, and I love that because I married somebody from North Carolina and I'm from Chicago originally. And so I totally understood that, that dynamic. So I appreciated that insight. Um, Cause there are, there are cultural differences that, you know, sound cliche, but are, are very real depending on where you are in the country. Well, and I, and I don't want to suggest that, uh, Nip, uh, that Lynn was a pushover uh, oh, at cool. all. As I uh, mentioned in the book, uh, her moniker uh, bestowed upon her by uh, at least one sheriff's office that she uh, uh, dealt with in her own legal practice had uh, dubbed her the ninja nun. And uh, <laughs> she was more than forceful when she needed to be. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. Um, so I, um, so perhaps I've watched way too many television shows, um, but where I kind of thought like the closing and opening statements were just, you know, stream of consciousness, obviously that is not the truth. And now as I see that you have the actual, you know, opening statement typed out. Um, so I, you know, I was wondering, do you, when you, you had obviously, kept these documents or had access to them. Um, so you were, I think you said you were around 34 when this all began, right? When you had, when you stepped foot into this case. Um, so Don, Don of today, looking back on Don of 34, um, what was it like to read those opening and closing statements? And do you feel you know, what do you, just what do you think about that and uh, about Don at 34, I guess? Well, I, I'm proud of the legal work. I, I think the legal work was uh, extremely well done and uh, I, I am proud of it uh, and pleased that it was so well done given my own level of experience at the time. Um, I uh, marvel at the energy and the stamina that we were able to bring to the case uh, in hindsight. Um, I also uh, have a renewed appreciation for my own family having gone through that. Uh, I was married, I had two young children. Uh, my wife is taking care of them while I'm down in Alabama, uh, running around pursuing convicted murderers to see if there'll be a witness for us and uh, recounting that to her by phone. <laughs> uh, a wonderful support system to have a uh, family like that supporting us in, in doing what we were doing. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, that's wonderful. And, you know, I so appreciate you coming tonight and I thank you. And somebody did type in, um, you know, did you meet Tommy in person or was it done remotely? So just to remind everyone, if you hadn't read the book, um, you know, this place, take, the book spans, like I said, centuries technically, but you know, it spans, it starts with Tommy in the eighties and kind of spans through the nineties and then into, um, you know, into, um, like more, I mean, very, just within a few years. And even now when um, Don does mention in the book that Tommy is still in, in jail right now. 
Um, so he's still going through, you know, some issues, some personal issues with the legal system. And um, I just want to end with, um, we have some, we have Allie from the book bin here and, you know, she said it was a great read. And um, I also want to make a plug for the book bin. Um, we had two bookstores selling books, the bookstall in um, Winnetcon. We also had the book bin and they had a really big part in this. So, um, and I was interacting and purchasing books from the book bin. So if anybody um, would like to buy any copies of the book, please feel free to reach out to them and support your local bookstore. And I just want to thank them so much for, um, for helping us sell books and letting us buy books from them. And they were really indispensable for the library getting their hands on some physical copies too. I couldn't agree more. Allie and the book bin yes. in Northbrook have been yes. wonderful partners. Yeah, yeah, they're great. Actually, I've never been there before. My husband went and picked up some books for me for the library and he came out, came back and said, you know, wow, that's such a cool bookstore and everyone seems so hip there. So, <laughs> so thank you for, for introducing the library to them as well. We appreciate it. So, all right. Well, thank you everybody so much for coming. And again, this, um, this has been recorded tonight. So we will put it on YouTube probably towards the latter half of this week. So um, feel free to check back on YouTube. And if you want to share the video, please feel free. Um, otherwise, thank you again, Don, so much. We really appreciate you coming to the library. Thank you, Jill. And thanks to the Wilmette Public Library. I appreciate it very much. Thank you so much. Have a great night, everyone.